Welcome to the seventh presentation in the fourth webinar series presented by the International Adsorption Society. The IAS is an international organization dedicated to advancing adsorption as a solution to scientific, engineering, and human welfare challenges. So, Sorry, a little bit of technical uh, problem. Through the uh, promotion of adoption research and education. We thank everyone for attending today. The webinar series has been an immense success and the recordings of previous webinars continue to be viewed on YouTube and Bilibili. This is the seventh webinar of our fourth series, which we will continue to have monthly throughout the year. We intend to continue with a variety of speakers from industry, academia, and other research institutes, as well as PhD students and early career researchers. Announcements regarding the fourth series will be distributed through the IAS mailing list and the IAS Twitter feed. Today's webinar will be given by Professor Jianwen Jiang at the National University of Singapore. I'm Gongkui Xiao at the University of West Australia. Today's webinar will be moderated by Dr. Chang at the Pusan National University in Korea. We are required to remind attendees and future viewers that the views expressed by the speaker, host, or other moderators are not necessarily those of the IAS or the institutions associated with those individuals. We ask that you consider joining the IAS as a regular member if you are not already. Our deals are minimal, only $20 US dollars per year, but support the publication of our flagship journal as option, uh, contrib contribute to travel grants and workshop seed funding for IAS members and affiliated groups as well as aid the organization of our triannual conference on the adoption, on the uh, fundamentals of adoption. Members also receive free access to IAS supported materials, including our journal, as well as the adoption database published by Spring of Materials. Anyone can follow the IAS on Twitter for future updates regarding IAS events, webinars and information about scientific meetings. Please help us expand our YouTube channel by liking this video and subscribing. I will now hand it to uh, Dr. Chang, who will, uh, who will introduce the speaker and moderate the YouTube Q&A. Uh, it is my great pleasure to welcome Professor Jian Wen Zhang to today's webinar session. Dr. Jianwen Zhang is a professor in the Department of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering at the National University of Singapore, a fellow of the Singapore Membranes of Science and Technology Consortium, and a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry UK. His research expertise is in computational materials modeling and molecular thermodynamics, currently focused on porous materials and membranes for energy, environmental, and pharmaceutical applications such as carbon capture and utilization, water desalination, and solvent recovery. He has published over 260 technical manuscripts with uh, 16,000 citations and H index of 75 based on Google Scholar. He's on, the, he's on the editorial board of AICH journal, Advanced Theory and Simulations, Computational Material Science, among others. During the webinar, questions can be submitted to the speaker as comments on the YouTube live stream. Questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. Uh, with that, I really welcome Professor Jia Wen Zheng again and pass over the presentation to him. All right. Professor Zheng. Sure, yes. yeah. Let me share the slides. Thank you. I guess you can see my slides, right? All right. So thank you, uh, Professor Chung and Dr. Xiu, for your kind introduction. So I'm very pleased to be here today to meet everyone remotely in this webinar. So, but before I start, I would like to thank the IAS for the kind invitation that I'll be able to share the recent computational work we have on MOFs 
for chemical separations. First, please allow me to spend one to two minutes to briefly introduce the work we have in my group. So we basically focus on the nano porous materials. Today we're going to discuss more on that. So we'll come back to this in a few minutes. So basically we focus on morphs and I'll also discuss a few examples for zips and the coughs. We also work on the polymer membranes and for polymer membranes, mainly for gas separation and also for liquid separation. And in the past a few years, we also work on gas hydrates and amphiphilic polymers or peptides. Now let's come to the today's topic, uh, morphs. I guess we all know that uh, the first time morph appeared in the literature was in 1995 by Omar But uh, we should also notice that the earliest example of this type of material actually was reported in 1995 by a Japanese group and uh, later on by uh, Robinson from Melbourne, Australia. And at that time, the structure was not stable if we remove the solvent or ligand. So we call this is the first generation of the morphs. Then in later 1990s and early like 2000, the structure becomes stable. Once we remove the solvent or the ligand, we call the second generation of the morphs. And then later on, I may touch on a little bit on the third generation and also the fourth generation. And also uh, uh, interesting to point out that uh, the first simulation study for gas adsorption was in 2001. And uh, in this case, gas adsorption in like a more uh, MOV2. So I show some of the structure for this a few uh, uh, landmark uh, uh, milestone studies. And our group actually conducted the first liquid separation uh, in uh, ZIP8. Um, I will come back to this in maybe 20 minutes. So basically we look at the water detonation through a zip 8 membranes. We know in the past 20 years, maybe a little bit more than 20 years, there have been tremendous large number of the studies published in like uh, Web of Science. If we search by uh, uh, the metal organic frameworks, we can find the exponentially growth of the number of the publications. And uh, in the past uh, few years, also a few spin of companies for example, uh, list a few here is uh, uh, up to like a 2021. There might be a few more in the past two years. And all these companies try to find a cheap way to, to produce large quantity of the morphs and also try to find the commercial applications of the morphs. We all know that at this moment, don't have, we don't have like a large scale application of the morphs, but there are a few uh, small scale, for example, this is called, uh, claimed to be the first commercial application of MOV by a company called MOV Technologies in 2016. So what they did basically use MOV as a media to store ethylene. Ethylene is produced during store or transport of the fruits or vegetables. So this is kind of like a, a demonstrated the first commercial applications. But we all know that at this moment, there are not too many like uh, really large scale uh, uh, applications. Many of the studies still focus on the potential applications. For example, for gas uh, separation, we'll discuss in a few minutes. The typical example is the CO2 capture, and they are also like ion, ion separation, water distillation, biofuel purifications. So gas storage, of course, the first, the last slide I mentioned, the first commercial application is kind of like already uh, more or less commercialized. But the most of the application, most of the studies at this moment, still in the laboratory scale, hasn't come to the large scale. And uh, most of these studies, as I mentioned, is a potential application. So it's interesting to find the possible uh, morphs for a certain application. And we have been working on almost all these different topics, but I will today only have the time to discuss the chemical separations. For example, for CO2 capture, basically gas separation, ion separation, water distillation, also the separation. We know separation is very important in the industry and also in science. I just give you a few examples. So scientifically, when people synthesize a new compound, need to separate for determine the structure, determine the property. So there was a paper two, uh, uh, 19, uh, three years ago in PNAS they have a statistical data for all the compounds in the past 200 years, find almost 14 million compounds. 
and they also uh, have an equation to determine the rate of the annual growth. So based on this data, we actually can find that uh, there are almost uh, 18 new compounds will be produced every hour. So basically after my talk today, 18 new compounds will be uh, produced mostly by chemists, chemists or material scientists. So they want to uh, also to determine the property, determine the structure of the new compounds. Certainly they need to separate the new compounds from uh, reactants, from the products. So separation is of course important scientifically. Industrially in practical situation, also extremely important. I will give two examples here. First one is the oil refining. We know the oil refining is extremely important. We use gasoline and many other oils every day. So every day, actually 90 million of barrels of oil is refined. It's a large quantity. On average, two liters per person on the earth. So globally, okay, two, per, two liters per person. The current practice we all know is by the traditional separation technology, distillation. Basically, we have a tower, so heat it up based on different boiling point, oil will be separated based on a different boiling point. So different grades of the oil we have here. And this is an extremely energy uh, intensive process because there's a phase transition for the oil. So this energy consumption is almost uh, the total energy use annually in UK. You can imagine the whole country, UK, the energy use is tremendously large. So this amount of energy certainly is very significant. Just to point out that Singapore is a small country, but we have uh, uh, actually one of the largest uh, oil refining center in the world. And particularly ExxonMobil, which is a very big oil company, has its largest oil refining plant in Singapore. It's not in, in like his headquarters in Houston. And the capacity is about 0.6 million barrel per day. So that's, that's pretty cool V uh, uh, number. I don't know the current number we have here. You may argue, yes, yes, oil is very complex. There are thousands of compounds. Certainly it's energy in, uh, intensive for the separation. But I'll give you another example. We have paraffin olefin separation. Basically we have like a C2 or C3 here. So we have adeline uh, and uh, have a propylene. So both compounds actually are most, very simple compounds actually are most produced. The very small organic compounds can be used for polymerization of the polyethylene and uh, many other polymers and uh, many other chemicals. So they are actually a large quantity produced every year. And uh, uh, ethylene propylene basically produced by the cracking of the uh, paraffin here. So we have uh, ethylene and the propylene, so cracking, reduce, uh, remove the hydrogen becomes the olefin. So the product is a mixture. So need to separate these two or these two we call C2 or C3 separation. Again, the current pra practice is using distillation because of the very similar close property between the two compounds C2 here or C3 here, they have a harsh condition. You can say the temperature, the pressure, very harsh condition to uh, achieve the separation. It's also very energy intensive. So globally, this amount of the energy, you can see trillion kilojoule, it's a huge amount. It's almost of 1.4 times of the annual electricity use in Singapore. Singapore is a small country, but it's a very advanced, a very modern country. So you can imagine the electricity use is also a tremendous large amount. So 1.4 times, four times is a really a huge number. So this is all based on the traditional distillation uh, technology, right? So we all know there are certainly advanced uh, separation technologies. For example, use solvent, we call absorption, use a solid material, as a solvent uh, for adsorption separation or use membrane material for membrane separation. All these turns out that uh, are more energy efficient compared to the distillation. And here example, certain number given for CO2, specifically for CO2 capture. And of course we need to use certain material, for example, adsorption use solvent, adsorption use adsorbent and membrane use also material. It's important too. Uh, for these advanced separation technologies. So based on the nature of the poor nature of the morphs, it can be used, certainly use, uh, use adsorbent or use membrane. So the work we have been doing is try to use more 
either as a, as a salt band, as a membrane for different chemical separations. And of course, the main purpose from the computational study is try to provide the bottom up insights can also give us the quantitative structure performance relationships. Eventually, of course, can help us to design new structures. So that's the objective we have. So I will go through a few examples, don't have the time to go, go through all of them, but I also point out that we also work on uh, theoretically using DFT calculations to study MOVs for chemical separations, uh, sorry, for chemical reactions. Separation and the reaction are the two pillars in chemical engineering, so it's important. We cannot say which one is more important. Sometimes the separation may be even more costly compared to reaction, so it depends on different situation. So today I'll only focus on the separation. I'll go through a few examples, but I don't have the time to discuss all the details. So basically we combine Monte Carlo simulation, molecular dynamics, and recently also machine learning, try to uh, uh, look at the molecular insights, try to screen morphs. Oh, we're not going to discuss all the detail here. I only have a one or two slides for different example you will see in a few minutes. But just to point out that uh, there are very general reference books for the simulation and also for the machine learning. And a few years ago, I edited a book uh, modeling uh, specifically on MOFs. So these are general uh, books. Certainly there are many excellent review papers in the past many years. If you have the interest, you can also try to look through the review papers. So let's uh, look at the first topic we have here, CO2, CO2 separation and capture. So when we say CO2 separation, we most of the case refer to uh, either natural gas or flow gas or shifted sink gas. And uh, each of them is uh, very important in certain industry application. So in the first example is we look at the natural gas upgrading. We know the main component in natural gas is the methane. So it's a main component. There are many other impurities. We also have like a C2, C3, and we may even have a nitrogen, but we didn't consider nitrogen here. So basically we have uh, this kind of mixture. The main component is methane. We want to remove two acidic gases in this case. So we have a hydrogen sulfur and a CO2 in the presence of water, in the presence of, of moisture. We know water is a very polar molecule. It would have a very strong affinity in hydrophilic material, in hydrophilic morphs. If we have a hydrophilic morphs, water would be very strongly at the top. Then the two gases, we acidic gases, we want to remove will have a very strong, very little chance to be at the top. So because of this, we were thinking we should try to identify hydrophobic morphs for this uh, uh, type of the separation. So once again, the objective is to remove these two acidic gases in the presence of water. So we all know that uh, they have been very nice data morph databases, for example, this called the core model database actually developed by uh, Professor Chung and uh, Lauren Disner. And this is the earliest version. The latest version already have more than 10,000 structures. So we started from this database, have like uh, five to uh, 6,000 structures. First, we try to narrow down the number by using the geometrical analysis. Basically, we determine the pore size. We uh, restrict the pore size between two and six. If it's a too small, gas cannot enter too large, not a selective, right? So this is the first step. Then we try to calculate the Hernis constant of water. And uh, we have a certain criteria, smaller than a certain number we identify as a hydrophobic morphs. As I mentioned earlier, the purpose is to remove these two acidic gases in the presence of water. And uh, we want to use hydrophobic morph to achieve this. Then we run a simulation for the, uh, for the entire gas mixture. We want to find the uh, top performing morph, which has the high adsorbed capacity for the two acidic gases and also high uh, adsorption selectivity. But I will uh, touch on in two minutes that these two uh, space cyclic separation performance metrics may not be sufficient because the morph we identified may not be stable. Right, so including stability measurements actually is very important. I will discuss in just one, two uh, more slides. 
And from the simulation, we can also try to find which type of living linker, which type of the metal would have a preferential absorption for the two acidic gases. You can see I don't have the time to discuss, discuss all the details. I only have one to two slides for each example. Just feel free later, any question, just feel free to discuss. As I just point out that the only look at the separation performance is not sufficient. For example, for CO2 capture, basically it's a CO2 nitrogen mixture through gas. Most of the study uh, in the literature, uh, studying from a database, could it be a hypothetical uh, database, could it be a real database like the one I mentioned earlier, core MOV database, then run the simulation, try to find the top performing MOV for a certain like a CO2 uptake larger than a certain value, then the selectivity larger than a certain value, then considered to be the top performing MOV. But as we all know that the stability is important for practical application, Separation performance certainly is, is also important, but if the structure is not stable, it's not useful. So in our recent study by actually said Muhammad, he include the stability metrics, including for example, thermodynamic stability, mechanical stability. In this particular case, we start from a hypothetical MOV database. We now, in addition to the experimentally based MOV database, there are many hypothetical uh, database in which the structures are computationally generated, may not be synthesizable, which means may not be exist actually, right? So we actually, we uh, conducted a very sophisticated uh, molecular dynamic simulation, try to determine the free energy of the MOVs, then try to determine uh, basically the thermodynamic stability, try to determine the, if the MOV is actually synthesizable. By including the stability metrics, we actually can find the final candidates. So this would be uh, actually very interesting uh, topic because we do need to consider the stability. Now let me move on to another little bit, uh, but I already mentioned earlier, very important for the paraffin olefin separation. Here I have an example for C3 separation and certainly also uh, very important separation for alkene isomers, saline isomers who have been working on all these different topics but they only have the time to share one of the example here. So, but the, the approach we use in this study would be different from the uh, last two examples. So here is for C3, basically propane and uh, propane separation. And we started from the core of a database, which is experimentally based. So this part is actually similar to, if you can recall one of the slides, for the uh, natural gas purification, we have a similar diagram starting from a database and we try to narrow down the number based on a few criteria. Then run the simulation, we can predict the top performing core MOVs for the separation. We can, of course, certainly try to develop the certain relationships between the structure and the performance. So that's basically kind of like a separate work we could have. But in this work, we extended the information we learned from the core of database, try to predict the performance in other databases. For example, we have a CSD, this is also experimentally based database. We also have a hypothetical or uh, a few hypothetical MOF databases. So the idea is, can we try to learn, use the knowledge we learned from this, this simulation in core MOF database to predict the possible top performing MOVs in other databases. So we do machine learning. So we have uh, visualized the MOVs and uh, train the machine learning models, then try to predict the performance. So if we uh, try to look at the different uh, databases, we can use this called TCNI maps. Basically it's a 2D uh, projection of the feature space. What we can clearly say is, so this is core MOV is the one we started here. We try to predict in other uh, databases. You can see that uh, if we look at the A and the B core MOV and the CSD MOV, they have very large similarity. You can see the different color, of course, but uh, they are more or less similar and also have a large overlap. As a result, we find that like, uh, we can relatively well predict the, uh, the performance of the CSD MOV starting from the core MOV database. But for the other few databases, you can clearly see 
don't have much overlap with the core morph database, right? You can see here is occupied this regime, but here is not similar to uh, for other uh, field databases. As a result, the prediction in this four was not good. So this gives us a very easy, uh, also very intuitive knowledge that by using the Chisney map, we can see the diversity and also can see the similarity between different databases before we do the prediction. So a very useful tool we actually find out. And of course, we can also find uh, which features is important. For example, uh, determine the Hernis constant, determine the selectivity or the capacity or TSM, basically it's a trade-off between these two. And uh, we can find uh, which one has uh, uh, the organic link, uh, inorganic uh, pore size, which one has a more important role in this kind of like a properties. Oh, I'm not going to discuss the detail. Um, another study, we also use machine learning method is what harvesting. We know the society is faced in, in short of fresh water, right? So fresh water is very important. We may try to uh, get the fresh water from the air or we may try to get from the ocean. So from the ocean, I'll discuss in a few minutes for the water destination. So in this particular study, uh, basically it used a sorbent to add the sub water, basically water vapor water from the air. So it's the absorption of water vapor in the sorbents. Uh, not too many studies experimentally, uh, but uh, I guess the, the, the pioneer is actually Professor Omanyagi. His group already demonstrated, also maybe already commercialized a few uh, morphs for the water harvesting. And uh, so basically not too many experimental studies. What we're thinking is try to use the knowledge we currently have in the literature, try to predict the possible morphs for water harvesting. Uh, uh, you may notice that uh, the last example where we try to use the simulation data to do the machine learning, we actually run the simulation to predict the, the uh, C3 separation. So we use simulation to predict uh, using the simulation data as a machine learning, uh, train a machine learning model. But you may also thinking that if it's possible, also use simulation to predict what vape in MOS. But we all know it's not actually a good idea because water is highly powder. It's actually very sensitive when we do the modeling, when we do the simulation, very sensitive to the atomic charge in morphs and also very sensitive to the type of the model we use for water. There are many different models for water. It's actually don't have a very reliable uh, which model should be used to describe water the absorption in morphs. In this case, we actually try to use experimental data to train a machine learning model. So uh, we have a, a student, Zimin. She collected experimental data from the literature, including the database and also some articles in 285 MOFs. Not a lot, as I mentioned earlier, uh, not actually many groups uh, working on the water harvesting. And, but uh, we managed to find this uh, amount of the data then train the machine learning model. Based on the machine learning model, we predicted the top performing morphs from the core morph database. It seems it works actually quite well for, uh, from the way we have here. So these are a few examples uh, for adsorption for the gas or in this case for water vape. Now I will switch the gear a little bit to come to the liquid phase. So we have a water destination as a, I will not say similar, but it's also try to solve the, the shortage of fresh water. For the last example, what half steam, we try to get fresh water from the air and the water destination basically try to get fresh air from the, from the ocean, from the sea. So basically remove uh, uh, the salt from the sea water. Water destination is actually extremely important, not only in worldwide, also in Singapore. Singapore is surrounded by ocean, right? but uh, actually because it's, a, it's not a fresh water. So it's actually 60% of the water used in Singapore is imported from Malaysia. So 60%, you can imagine it's a large quantity. So the government also put a lot of emphasis to distillate water to get fresh water. This is also the case uh, worldwide, particularly in Middle East, you can see this is a map for the distillation plants 
uh, all over the world, particularly in Middle East, already commercialized. But uh, uh, in current uh, distillation plants, polymer membranes are widely used as a separation media for the air and the water. And always there are uh, research work going on, try to develop more advanced or more uh, energy saving membranes. And the morph, of course, that's one of the interesting material we can explore. So that was almost 12 years ago, our group started the, the, uh, this kind of proof of concept the simulation study. We use ZIF-8 as a membrane here. Then we have a sea water, we have a sodium chloride, we add the pressure. So this kind of uh, simulation system is to mimic the reverse osmosis process. And we do find that the ions cannot go through the membrane, but the water from the sea water actually can go through. So this actually, to a certain extent, demonstrate that the ZIF-8 membrane can be used as like a reverse osmosis membrane. And after the simulation study, there were a few experimental study. They truly found that if we if they add a ZIF into like a existing polymer membranes can enhance the water permeability. So that's uh, demonstrated as a reverse osmosis membrane. We also further in collaboration with Professor Huang from Shanghai. And uh, so basically they, they, they produce experimentally a ZIF-8 membrane with a thickness of about 20 micrometer. We actually run a simulation uh, in the simulation system. The thickness is much smaller. In this particular case, as a perforation membrane, we actually found a very good agreement between the predicted results and the experimentally determined uh, water permeability. So you may argue that uh, the two uh, length scales completely different, almost uh, uh, 10,000 times difference. But here, the water permeability is an intrinsic property will not depend on the thickness of the membrane. So that's the beauty of this uh, uh, permeability, this quantity. Certainly, there are other quantities we cannot compare with experiment because of the different scales. I will come back to this uh, towards the end of my talk. So this is uh, demonstrate ZIF-8 can be used either as reverse osmosis membrane or the perforation membrane. We further try to look at the functional group. So in this case, we have five row type of the ZIFs have the same topology, you can say quite a similar three-dimensional network, but the pore of functional groups in the pore is different. We have a methyl group quite hydrophobic. We have like amino, we have a hydroxyl group. As a result, you can see the pore size and also the, uh, the hydrophobicity of the pore surface would be different. If we look at the number of the water molecules across the membrane, we can clearly say that in the two, these two ZIF-93 and the ZIF-97, they have a very small pore diameter. Certainly the number is not so great, but I look at the other three, they have a much larger, certainly the number is large red, but if we have a closer look between like a 25, 71, 96, 25, among the three, 25 has the smallest diameter, but it actually has the largest number across the membrane. 96 has the largest diameter, but it, it has the smallest number. The reason is because this is hydrophobic uh, functional group. So the pore surface is hydrophobic. Hydrophobic would have a weak affinity for water. So it would facilitate the water transport through the pores. So that's in 25. But in 96, we have a middle group is more or less or at least compared to the metal group is more hydrophilic. So the pore surface is more hydrophilic, have a strong affinity for water. So we'll slow down water transport. So based on this, you can say, if we have a hydrophobic uh, pore surface in the pores, uh, in the, inside of the pore, then would we'll facilitate the water transport. So in a recent uh, uh, work, we, um, we, uh, we have an excellent uh, collaborator, Professor Dan Zhao in our department. So his group experimentally used called CC3. CC3 is one uh, porous organic cage. Just to point out that the por uh, porous organic cage called the POCs are, uh, were, was actually developed by uh, Andrew Koop's group in UK. 
and uh, they have a, a series of different uh, POCs. And in this particular study, Professor Zhao's group embedded the CC3 into the liposome from a channel and they try to determine the water permeability. And the channel here is hydrophobic. You see the yellow color here is hydrophobic, as I mentioned earlier, hydrophobic actually would facilitate the water transport if we have a hydrophobic uh, pore surface. So experimentally found that the water permeability for this CC3 is actually remarkable, comparable to like aquapolin and uh, some other carbon nanotubes. So we want to find the, the fundamental mechanism. So we run a molecular dynamic stimulation. We have a CC3 uh, uh, channel here, it's a hydrophobic. Because it's hydrophobic, right? Sometimes you can see water in the channel, sometimes actually don't have. So we call the wetting, the wetting transition. And the pore size is not very large and we can find called a single file flow. Don't have a multiple water come across together. And also a very good agreement that we actually find. So this once again, demonstrate that if we have the hydrophobic pore surface inside the pore, of course, would facilitate water transport. I come to almost the uh, last uh, 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 topic. So we have the cough membranes. In this particular case, we have uh, seven different cough membranes, also with different functional group. But here we don't have a pore because we can see it's a 2D cough layer. So you can see this is a layer here. So we have aperture. So the aperture diameters are also different. It depends on different functional group. So this study is also for water destination. And uh, we actually can find that the water flux versus the aperture diameter. So of course, increase the diameter, the flux will increase more or less. But we find that the hydrophilic one, uh, uh, basically the hydrophilic aperture, the water flux is larger compared to the hydrophobic. Seems controversial to the previous a few examples I mentioned earlier. It was a hydrophobic or the facility, the water transport, right? But the difference is in this case, we don't have a pore, we only have aperture, only have aperture here. So if it's a hydrophilic, would it facilitate the water coming near the like aperture and go through this layer? But the previous examples, we have a long, like a pore. So inside the pore surface, the pore, if it's a hydrophobic, would facilitate water transport. So these two actually are actually no controversial between the two. So this uh, study, once again, we have a seven uh, uh, single layer, two dimensional cough uh, membranes. We were thinking if we put some of them together, what will happen? So that's our recent study we have here. So we consider two particular uh, layers. One is this one, another one is here. So this one, the functional group, we have amylyl group NH2, and here we have a hydroxyl group. Now, if we put a single layer of this, uh, this layer here, we add an electrical field, we have a potassium chloride on the left and also the same here on the left. Under the electrical field, potassium ion will go through the layer, so we have an ion current. If we reverse the electrical field, the ion current will also be reversed. So basically we have this behavior, the ion current is proportional to the, uh, the electrical field. So positively and negatively. So the positive negative electrical field give us the same amount of magnitude of the current. Of course, the direction is different. Similar for this single layer, if we also put the similar condition, we find the similar ion current. So this is a traditional or normal the electrical resistance. So basically nothing uh, fancy here. But uh, interestingly, if we put them together, have a hybrid bilayer, you can see the bilayer here, then we find that if we add the electrical field, then if it's positive electrical field, that's the current that we have. If we reverse the electrical field, there's almost no ion current. So that's something very interesting. And uh, we actually uh, uh, call the electrical diode, uh, diode. This has a very important application for energy storage and osmotic energy generation. But uh, we try to find uh, out why this happens. Let's take a closer look of the two structures. So the first one, we have a middle group here. So if you take a closer look, we have the nitrogen Atom, nitrogen atom is near the outer layer of the, of the aperture here. 
once again, I will not, I will not call this is a pole. This is not a pole. We don't have a long dimension, uh, one dimensional pole, it's an aperture. And uh, because high nitrogen is negatively charged, as a result, near the pole, the outer layer, or sorry, I should not say pole is aperture, the outer layer, we have uh, electrostatically negatively charged, we have a negative potential. But in this structure, we have a hydroxyl group. It turn uh, orientated in such a way, hydrogen, which is positive near the outer layer of the aperture, so will generate positive electrical field. So one is positive, the other one is negative. Then if we take a closer look, uh, this is similar to the last slide. In this particular structure, because we have a nitrogen near the outer layer of the aperture, so it's negatively charged. Because it's negatively charged, right? So it would have, uh, uh, compared to uh, positively charged, it would have uh, more preferential for kind of ion to come near the aperture. So kind of ion will come here, will go through the aperture. So it's kind, uh, kind of ion selective. So that's what we observed here. Add the electrical field, so the uh, potassium ions will go through the aperture. If we reverse the electrical field, go opposite the direction. And we can also further find that the, from the potential of mean force curve, potassium ions has a much lower energy barrier to cross over because it's negatively charged, the aperture. Now for this uh, structure, the aperture part is more or less positively charged. So the facilitate the anion to transport. So in this case, chloride will, will go through and the reversely also chloride will go through and the chloride ion also have a lower uh, uh, energy barrier to cross the aperture, to cross the layer. But if we put them together, you can see here, if we put them together in such a way that we have uh, one layer here, another layer here. If it's, this is a uh, kind of ion uh, selective, this is an ion selective. Now, if we add the electrical field, and, uh, oops, under the electrical field, the potassium ion will go through from the left to the right, follow the arrow up here. So this, because this layer is kind of ion selective, so the potassium ion will come to this layer, enter into the aperture here. Similarly, the chloride also under the electrical field will come this way and it will come here because this is an ion selective, right? So we have a potassium here, chloride here, they have a, a, they have a mutual attraction synergetically. So potassium will come to all the way to the right hand side. Chloride will come all the way to the left hand side. So there's a current. Now, if we reverse the electrical field, reverse the electrical field under the electrical field, the potassium will, in principle, will come in this way, but uh, come to this layer. This layer is an ion selective, so we'll block the potassium to enter into this layer. So basically, potassium cannot enter. Similarly, for chloride, so under the electrical field, in principle, we should come here, but this layer is kind of ion selective. As a result, don't have the ions in the either this layer or another layer here. As a result, there's no ion current. So that's basically we find the reason why uh, the single layer behaves like a, a resistor, but the, the hybrid bilayer behaves like a diode. So this once again have a useful application for the energy storage. With this, I uh, will wrap up my uh, presentation today. So basically I give a few uh, case studies for chemical separations for different applications, CO2 separation, hydrocarbon, and also the CO2 capture, water destination. Of course, one another case is a water harvesting. And uh, I only have uh, like one to two slides for each example. So I didn't have the time to go through all the details. In principle, I may have like 20 slides for each of the example. So in principle, I want to say is we, from the simulation, we actually find a lot of very useful insights and also quite a useful structure property relationships. And of course, we can identify the possible uh, top performing morphs for us to like uh, identify possible one. And furthermore, of course, can help us to design the new structures. 
With this, I would thank all the current members and also the past uh, former members who contributed to the work I share with you today, and also the collaborators we have here uh, in Singapore or overseas. But before I end, just a, a personal perspective. We uh, just uh, for those who ha have experience in the simulation, we know that uh, in a simulation study, the simulation system we have usually is in land scale is 20, 10 to 100 nanometers. Time scale for the MD simulation, maybe 100 to uh, one micron. So based even sometimes maybe 10 nanoseconds. So this compared to experimental measurements, right? Experimental measurements, maybe one minute or once one hour. And uh, experimental land scale is also much larger. For example, membrane, as I mentioned to you, one for example, we have a 20 micrometer. But uh, although the, the scales are different in simulation and in experiment, for certain properties, I also show to you, we have a very good agreement, for example, for the water permeability. So it, because it's an intrinsic property, it will not depend on the thickness, will not depend on a land scale, but for other properties, for example, water flux would actually inversely proportional to the thickness. So in that case, of course, we just should not compare with experimental results. So moving forward, of course, uh, for ex uh, simulation and computational uh, group, we should try to maybe develop multi-scale methods, try to bridge the different scales uh, between experiment and the simulation. And I also point out that uh, most of the study we have and also too in the literature, in the community, uh, most of the computational study uh, do, do not consider the stability, but uh, we also mentioned that the stability is actually very important, right? Even the performance, separation performance is good, but if the structure is not stable, basically it's not useful. So for further uh, computational study, we should try to include the stability in many other applications, uh, separation, not only in the gas separation, the liquid separation, we should also consider the stability. And the most of the study, including the one I share with you today, we consider the structure, the structure of the morphs are rigid, but a certain structures, for example, even zip eight, they have a structure flexibility. In principle, of course, we should include the flexibility. Actually, the flexible morphs we call third generation. Experimentally, not too many group. Uh, Professor Kitagawa in Kyoto University is a pioneer. So his group actually look at a lot of like a, a flexible or dynamic or soft morphs, and they call porous coordination polymers. They usually don't call it the morphs. But basically, they are the same thing. So his group has uh, actually focused on the flexible uh, soft morphs. Uh, in terms of the modeling, so uh, much more complicated. We need to consider the intra framework interaction and uh, compare to flex, uh, rigid morph, much more complicated. But we also should notice that uh, uh, they have some like a very unique properties can be. Uh, behaviors can be observed in like a flexible morphs, for example, gating, um, uh, gating pressure and the gate opening, all these actually not exist in the rigid morphs. So to further move on, we should also consider the flexibility and the even the structure transition in the further um, modeling studies. And all the uh, study I presented today, we look at the fundamental, uh, le uh, uh, basically fundamental level. We didn't try to, and actually we don't have the expertise, look at the, the process level, right? But in principle for the real application, not only the material properties are important. We also need to look at the, the whole process, the whole system level. Sometimes by doing the process optimization, uh, material which has poor material property may even actually have a good performance. So process level, uh, system level optimization is also important. Finally, I, you may remember that I mentioned about the energy consumption, but here once again, that is not something we can consider. We only look at the, the fundamental uh, 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 insights. In principle, we should also have more holistic uh, analysis 
including uh, the, the, the cost of the material and the energy consumption, all this in to together to do a more holistic uh, uh, analysis to find the possible uh, application of the MOFs. Certainly this cannot be done by a group need to have a collaborative, collaborative efforts among different groups. So with this, I will stop here. So I'll be happy to take any question you might have. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor Zhang, uh, for a very nice presentation. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I, uh, there are a few questions on the yeah. uh, YouTube, so I'm gonna read them. Uh, uh, James Xiao asks, uh, for the water harvesting, are the identified mobs experimentally available? And what is the potential of their large scale application? Um, Mm, good. So, yeah, and, I uh, cannot see the message. Mm -hmm. I somehow I cannot see the message, right? I cannot see. Yes. Yeah. So. So. Yeah. Uh, yes. The. Uh, we start for the water harvesting. We collect the experimental data, and in two eighty five morphs. So of course these are all experimentally available. Then we use the machine learning model to predict the, the performance in core morphs. So the predicted or the one we identified is all experimental and variable morphs. So the so second kind of, part of, yeah, sorry. So kind of extent, extension of his question would be, uh, we are assuming that the, the models are models from these experimental morph database is correct. It's similar to the, the water system that comes from the morph, the water system that's the morph, from, the morph, from the morphs, right? The experimental water is, um, mm. is yeah, measured I, from MOF, model, MOF structure. And we are assuming that the MOF structure from the experimental system is the same as what's available from the database. Uh, we, when we predict, we exclude those already we collected, actually. So basically, mm -hmm. the one we collected, the one we predicted, both are available, but there's no overlap. There's no problem. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure if I answered the question. So basically, we have a 285 morphs in which yeah. experimental data are available. So in these two, uh, then we, then we predict the uh, performance or in the core morphs, we actually remo remove there are some uh, so because among the core morphs. Some maybe already one of the or a few of the two eighty five morphs. So we basically remove mm -hmm. exclude these two eighty five mm -hmm. morphs in the core morph database. Then mm -hmm. we do the prediction for the rest of the core morphs. Okay. So where do you get the features from for those uh, for the water system? Oh, uh, so all, yeah. everything is based on the water the soft as a term. So based on as a term, we determine the maximum amount of the adsorption. We determine the working capacity between two humidities, and uh, we also can try to determine, for example, the Hernis constant. All these are based on experimentally determined adsorption as a term. Then we train the machine learning model. From the model, we can have the features and also the feature importance. Okay, thank you. Uh, another okay, question you. is Benjamin uh, Clayson. Uh, he says, thanks for the talk. I was interested in the hydrophobic mobs for water desalination. Why are, hydro why are hydrophobic mobs leading to a higher water permeability? And All permeability, right. he says, mm -hmm. to sorption time diffusion coefficient. So I would guess that enhancing sorption would increase water permeability as in hydrophilic mobs, but not in mm -hmm. hydrophobic mobs. Right. In polymer membranes, usually because polymer membranes are amorphous, don't have a well-defined channel, don't have a well-defined pores. So normally people think that in polymer membranes, hydrophilic polymer membranes would be good or, or would be better than the hydrophobic for water um, uh, permeability. You can imagine that uh, when we have a uh, well-defined uh, structures, for example, like example I discussed early for zips, we have a very well-defined uh, channel and a pores. When water enter into the pore, pass through the, uh, the pore and the exit, they have uh, two basically uh, two um, kind of like uh, factors we need to consider. First is water need to enter into the pore. Then, will transport it through the pore. When the pore is for a quite a long pore, that's the safe uh, example we had, 
So the transport inside the port becomes more important than the, the, the when compared to the I mentioned another factor is entering entering into the port. So in this case, when the pore is hydrophobic, have a relatively weak interaction with water. So which means water will not be strongly attracted by the pore surface. You can also imagine that, uh, yes, in terms of the adsorption, yes, water may have low adsorption, but in this case, diffusion will dominate. So weak interaction, water will diffuse faster. As a result, the overall effect is water, at least in the system we studied, Water in a hydrophobic uh, zips would have a higher uh, permeability compared to the hydrophilic one. I'm not sure if I answered the question. So basically, the diffusion coefficient in the hydrophobic channels are faster than hydrophilic channels. Right. Yeah. Although we didn't look at the uh, separately the, the softening and the diffusion, but it should be the case, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, and the last question was from uh, James Xiao, and then he asked, for energy application, has the separation of nitrogen methane been studied? Uh, this is a uh, little bit general question. Uh, yeah. Sorry, it's hydrogen and, and uh, methane? No, ni nitrogen and methane. Okay, so yeah, they, they, yeah, they, they are, I, I noticed there are uh, experimental study, maybe also a computational study for nitrogen and uh, methane. I think yes, the answer is yes, but we didn't uh, mm -hmm. consider this gas mixture. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So, uh, so I, I have a question about sure, yeah. the uh, T. So you had the, you train the model on the core maps and then use it for different maps. Mm -hmm. And in that case, you we had to look into this. Uh, you use the TSNA method, right? Yeah, to make sure that uh, they 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 are representative of mm -hmm. the uh, other other database. Uh, so it's basically you, you need to make sure that when you do develop this method and use it for other database, you need to make sure or the other the other data set, you have to make sure that these the combination of features that are that are present in the other database. Is that is that correct? Is that is that mm -hmm. seems like that's very important. I mean it's a it's, it's a tool to facilitate uh, our analysis. If yeah. we find if we use the Disney maps, we find that the two or different databases have like a when we look at the picture, if we find a large similarity and also the regime also quite close, we can we can intuitively say that the prediction will be good. Otherwise, mm -hmm. maybe the prediction will not be good. But it's it's a it's a tool we can use. It's not something we have to use actually. Okay. Yeah. But do you do you see like a very 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 large difference if you use a mo one mod model developed from the different regions of TSN TSNE map and use it for the other data data set from different yeah that's what that's the yeah that's the way I want to go to the slides that's the way we find yeah. between the two databases if the similarity is very large on the TSNE maps we do find a quite a good prediction otherwise the prediction is actually not good yeah okay okay well thank you very much oh, thank <laughs> Professor you. Chen the time and then the excellent presentation. Uh, now I'm going to hand over to uh, Dr. Xiao uh, to wrap up the uh, webinar. Thank you, Professor Xiao, for your comprehensive presentation and your insight into the direction of a computational work for chemical separations. We also thank all of our attendees for joining this webinar and hope that it was both educational and enjoyable. An edited version of the webinar will be posted on the IAS YouTube channel and Bilibili with the announcement on the IAS Twitter feed. The hope is that the work discussed today will be a useful resource for the adsorption science uh, community in the future. And the next uh, confirmed IAS webinar will be given by uh, Rahul, Banerjee on 9th of August. Announcements regarding the next webinar and other IAS online events will be posted on our Twitter feed and through the IAS uh, mailing list. With that, we thank you for joining us and we hope you will join us again soon. Thank you.
Yeah, I think, uh, thanks Dr. Xiu and the Professor Chun and also thanks to everyone. Yeah, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zhang. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Dr. Zhang.